Now, before I go on to invite the speakers, uh, I might just say a little about diplomacy and conflict. In my language, the word ambassador. Yesterday, we talked about ambassadors, we talked about diplomacy, we talked about people's ambassador. The word ambassador, in my language, means simply a messenger. Somebody who carries a message from one authority to another. And in the old days, ambassadors were just that. They carried the message from the monarch, from one monarch to another monarch. And if the monarchs accepted them as messengers, they were given the right to come and present themselves in the court and remain present in the court. And this was the traditional thing. However, with modernization, we find a complete transformation in the institutions of diplomacy, of embassies, of ambassadorship. And this is, again, an aspect of modernization. And I think people who are involved with the Rojava revolution talk about modernization and its problems a great deal. But perhaps this session, we can address another facet of modernization and politics as we experience it. Now, I have it on the authority of Karl Marx that diplomacy, as we know it now, starts with modernization and what he calls the bourgeois revolutions. And in his text called Secret Diplomatic, Diplomatic History of the 18th Century, he talks about the whole craft of diplomacy as part of statecraft. And he talks about the deceit and the deception. And I think yesterday there was talk about truth telling. And, you know, and, and how the lying, for want of a more clearer word, that goes on in the name of statecraft. And whatever your feelings about Karl Marx, I think one thing we can have to grant it to him is that he knew European society very, very well. I mean, that much I think we need to grant to Marx. And you fast forward from 18th century history, which he recounts of diplomacy and of embassies, you've come to the Second World Wars, again, where you, there is a big, huge, transformative change in the statecraft. We find in the name of wartime exigencies, wartime needs, the establishment of institutions like the security services, like the CIA. Yeah, the National Security Service in the United States was established as a wartime need but it never was unfolded. It just changed its name, became the CIA, and continues to operate even now. MI6, all these organizations which were established, which actually pushed the diplomatic agenda of, of states. We didn't even recognize this, and only very recently, we have started talking about what is called the deep state. The deep state being the Pentagon-driven, the MI6-driven, states which set the agenda for the political representatives that we believe act in our names. I mean, this is another layer of statecraft that we haven't quite come to grips with. Fast forward again to Watergate, and you have a whole revelations and, and changes in statecraft and diplomacy. And we have the development of the internal and external aspects of politics. The internal aspects, which is internal to the state, we think is, you know, should be democratic. The state should be accountable to the citizens. And if a citizen, if a police beats up a citizen, then the, somehow the state and the, has to address that. But if the same state beats up somebody who's not a citizen, then that's okay. So you see the internal and external dimensions. We need democracy at home, so we are told, you know, you can ask for rights within the state, but as far as relations outside the state go, that is a prerogative. And it's constitutionally sanctioned prerogative of the state. If you look at the British Constitution, there is a royal prerogative which actually allows the executive, without any democratic process, to declare war, 
The same thing with the American presidency, that he's also the president of the United States, is also the commander in chief of the military. So you have a whole different layer. So internally, we can demand democracy. Externally, whatever the state does is does, done in the name of national security and our benefits, which is not accountable democratically. That, that's the uh, main thing. And then you fast forward to the era of WikiLeaks, and we find the embassies are, again, the sites of intrigue, exactly as Marx talked about in the 18th century. It's in the, if you look at the diplomatic cables in the WikiLeaks, it's the diplomatic cables. And these diplomatic cables are sent from embassies around the world to their governments to decide, you know, war, peace, various kinds of issues. And again, and I find it extraordinary, 18th century diplomacy, and you come to WikiLeaks, and this, the fact of embassies as sites of intrigue, the fact of diplomacy as deceit and cheating, whether it is rendition as we know it today, or whether it is the 18th century that Marx talks about, it seems that that hasn't really quite gone away. And so, of course, we have the case of Abdullah Ocalan himself. I mean, what happened in the Kenyan embassy? The Kenyan embassy was the site where these intrigues were hatched and he was rendered back to Turkey. So we can see this problematic thing. Now, all these are things that we know about. <clears throat> Along come our dear Yona Stahl and his team, whom I love dearly. And they tell us, no, you should stop thinking about embassy as sites of intrigue. They tell us, don't think of you know diplomacy as something that is about lying and cheating between states and duping and war and this. We have to think of a new way of thinking about diplomacy as something between people, as something you know of, of promoting the good, if you like, for want of a better word. Yeah? And that actually completely challenges us to think about questions of diplomacy, questions of embassies, questions of ambassadorship. They say to us, no, you should think of embassy as this beautiful space that we are in where art meets politics. It's a radically different understanding of embassies. You should see us all sitting here as people who, pro as, okay, thank you. As people who will uh, promote, you know, who will promote friendships between us, who will share common ideals of peace and prosperity for our people. So, on that extremely di different concepts of, of uh, uh, ambassadorships, of diplomacy, of things, it's a challenging, a very, very challenging task and a very challenging ask by Jonah, Jonas and his team to ask us to reconceptualize the whole thing, which has had a very, very long history. Luckily, I'm not going to do the reconceptualizing. Instead, I'm going to ask Aldar Zalil, who is our first speaker, who will actually, on whom falls the responsibility, if you like, of taking this extraordinary job of unpacking the meaning of embassies and diplomacy. But before that, I do that, I just want to just set out uh, uh, what we plan to do today. What I want to do is, after Aldar has finished his talk, I will invite some responses from our key respondents, and then we can take a 10-minute break, and we can then carry on with Q&A, and if we have time, ask for more responses from the respondents. Now, just by way of introduction, Aldar Zalil is the Executive Council member of the Movement for Democratic Society, which is TEVDEM. And uh, TEVDEM is an inclusive and progressive body that seeks to meet the needs of all the various peoples of Rojava based on respect for all ethnicities, religions, and culture. So may I ask Aldar, please, to come here and to address us 
on this very difficult subject of diplomacy and embassies and ambassadorships and what you have to say about it from your experience. Sarid, Hamel Sazi, Desgehu, Rechstin, and Gobun Alikar, Gavin Nertia, Rojava, F. Habat, we may shandin a mass pass the king. Heroha, the Rojava, Kurdistan, and Mohaben, Sharak, the Sermahati, first kirin, the Suri Rojava, the Irish and Grand Picti, Jberveke, Geleme, Hame, Beshen Hue, Joan in Rojava, Hortu, Ketchin Rojava, Berhodaniak, Mazil, Berambari, Wakerin. The Anjama Weber Hodane de Juan and Rojava go Shahid Ketten, as Tava Birtin, Bejna Huel, Beramberi Shahid and Rojava, O Suria Tawin. Waki then Iro Bisto Hafte Mahayas Dai, O Ahavdwan and Beri Miji Basker and go Brez Ojalan, Hodi Bandora Kamazin, Lesser Shoresha Rojava, Uma, Lesser Felsafa, Brez Ojalan, Avhabat Daime Shandin, and Anjama and Felsafa Ojalan Pratike, the Gijian Dekin, Beria. سیو نه سالان فارتیا کارگری کردستان اوجلا مخدا مزران ایرو سر سال اوی ام سر سال اوی جو توای گلین کرد او گلین دن پیروز دکن شرم که مروهایی گروه برک بفرنگی ایرو زندان ده دگراو که دنوا بحری دجیان بکن مجارا میگو ام لسرجی دا خوین دیسا گریدای یانجی جو فلسفه برز اوجلا در دکه و اوجی نرخاندن روشا شر و دبلوماسیه ما در جوای کردستان دجبو گیاندن راستیا ظلم اگول متکرین تعدادی اگول گلین متکرین سیستم دسپوت یا گول سر سر سوریه تواهیدات مشاندن دس به خبات کی بیرنگی که وقتی گو چاو سیستم دولت آن وندی و یانجی دولت بخو وقت سازیک دس هلاداریه امدن ارخینن ما سیستم کی دموکراتیک یا جوای پیش خست وقت وی دبلوماسی جیم دگرند است. گه دبلوماسی نه یا جوایک به راستی یا جوایک ندی نشاندن گه به آ سیستم دولتی و چه ام نکار نوی دبلوماسی بکن دبلوماسی دموکراتیکی سیستم دولتی چه قیصی خورد به دموکراتیت پیش نکه و کی گو چه و آگر تنکار به چه آگر کی ساره تنکار به همان دمی جبو دولتی جبه جد دولتک دموکراتیک دبگو دولت لواز به خورد به یان ضعیف به وق آگر هکی گرمایی اوی کم یان زیاده لین نکاره به به دولت که دموکراتی که انجی گارانتی از دموکراتی بینه. در رجواهای کردستان هده وقتی گو چاو مجلس کمین سازیان جوایکی همه دزجهن در ایت جوایکی هاتن آواکرین اینی وقتی دبلوماسیا رجواجی هات پیش خستن. مخابن در سوریه ده بشندن یه گو گهرتنه دخوازن. الترناتیف کیوان جبو چارسریه که دموکراتیک پیش نکت. هزین دنی در سوریه ده هر کس دوسا الترناتیف چهود سیستم آگوهای او ببند سلادار وان جبو ای خواهد کرد. جب افجی بوسه دمک گو هر کس دست دست خودت خنای و سوریه و سوریه به بقاده کی شر ایدی سوریه بوی مینا شر جهانی سیمین لتیجیان کردن. پارازوان این سیستم آگوین دبن نه این جدات جداده. جبرگول در دوری متف آبون شورش آرج آوال برانبری تحدیات و زحمتی مزنما. لی تشتی گو بو علی کارگ ام کاربن دشورش آرج آوال در راستی خواه به هر کسی بدن ناسکرین بر خدانا جلی میا گول پیش کت و هر وها این گو ایریش کرین راستی انوانش جهان تفر در کت نورته. دسوریه د دمعادله سوریه هزین گو هنر یک رژیم کی دسپوت، رژیم کی ناوندی، رژیم کی شوونی دیکتاتور لسرد سلاداریه. گروپین بنابر معارضه ی دندره سوریه، اوجی جبود سلاداریه دخوازن تک هن دوسا رژیم آنا لی نخودی پروژه ک دموکراتیک یا جوایکین. و اف گروپ آنا جبرگو خودی هشمندیه کو سابون بون سدم گوشر و نکوکید ناو سوریه د پیش بکن. هر وها تابی گو هول دان چه بون لجنه و چاره سری یکش بو سوری واردیتن ل دیسا پارازوان این سیستم کهون قبول نکردن گو ام وقت شورش آرج آوا تابل وان هفتیتن آم ببن دان جامه ده هول دان این هفتیتن این جنه و آوجی بین کهتن د شورش آرج آوا ده دبلوماسی و سیاست آگاهی مشاندن و بر خدا نگاهی کردن 
وک مینا تد بخچه کی ماینانده لغمان دب مشه. آنا روشه که با آلوز جداتر تیجیان کردم. دولت جیران همچ علی باکرده نوی دولت ترکیه در دوری نهصد و یازده کیلومتر سینور که هفتش نبرد مدهی. او جه دو هزار و یازده ورده هر دم مداخله هندری مکر. دما مداخله نوی سیاسی دبلوماسی و آبوري بسر نکتن ایدی بر داعش دامه. داعش پیوستی اگو از وی پناسه بکم زیاده تن نج بر سر انسان انجید کن هویتی او تیزانی و اف پشتگیری اترکان جداش ره خودی رول که پر نی نی بود روش اسوریه. آن داعش بر بتن ابو نیفده چه و بر خدانا قلیم او دشکینه دوان دقیق و ام آن داخلین شر و پفچون نبرا هزین روز آوا و داعش ایده بر دوامن دولت اترکی مخابن به هزا خوی لشکری پشتگیری آوان دکل. او دبلوماسیا دولت دم شاندن خاپاندن ایت که شر راده که او بوی نوی دب نوی او جی شر تروره بکه لی او بخواته پشتگیریا داعش دکه لی ام دخوازن هر کس وی زانه به گه ام در رجاوای کردستان ایده گروی شری وی بر خودان ایده کن نج برگم عاشق شر نو کیف همه شرته ام آشیتی وک هوی و براتی و جیان هف وش دخوازن باوری همه بشر گو بشر تجاری چاره سری پیش نا کهدن این جه بشر امدکارم بر خوبدن خوب پارزن و اف سبب آبینگهین که ایرو روزاواد نواشرده. هر وها قناعت ما باوری ما وق روزا شورش روزاوا امدبین ایرو به سبب سالک دن به ده سال دن به پیوست دیالوگ لپش که به ام وق طرف این پرسگری که لحه رونن پرسگری کا سوری و آر روزاوا گفت و گفت کن اول سری اساسی بگن اتفاقی. همه هزین خودی باندور د دوسیا سوریه د گره که ببین عالی کارج و پیش خستنا ریان چاره سریه ی آشتیانه. گر شورش آرژاوا به وان راستی خوی فلسفی پیش بکه و او ببین مسوگریا پیکاتن آمافه توای گلند هندری سوریه د. رجواه که آرام رجواه که دموکراتیک و نوا آشتیه د دیواتای سوریه که آرام سوریه که دموکراتیک سوریه که آشتیانه. هر وها سوریه که دموکراتیک جی دب مسوگر مسوگریج با مافی گل کرد در رجای کرد سانیده. جبر ویجی ام تجاری پرچابونی سوری نخوازن و ام دخوازن و گل کرد و گل سوریان و آسور و ترکمن و عرب و هر کس به هر رژیم بکن دستمک دموکراتیک ده لی دنوا خاک سوریه ده و مافی مجی پرستی بر. ام باورن جهانا مروهایی بتفجی جوکا مروهایی بتفی ببین پشتگیری جبا شورش آرژ آوا و شورش آرژ آوا ریا خوب بینه گو د نتنه د سوریه و رژ آواده د رجلات آن بینه جهان دیجی ببین مینا که کی سیستم دموکراتیک اجوا کی سپاس ثانکیو ثانکیو Thank you, Alder, for that very succinct and clear presentation on the differences between the diplomacy that I described and the diplomacy that you have laid out that coming from your uh, work in Rojava. Um, it is, I have always found this aspect of the Kurdish uh, movement very interesting. You mentioned the Geneva talks. And uh, if, you, if you look at the discourse in the West about democracy and freedom and so on, it always talks about democracy, participation. It talks about gender rights, which is very, very prominent in the discourse on democracy. And it talks about uh, you know, human rights, which is the foundation of the Kurdish movement, in a sense. And yet, when it comes to the Geneva talks, this is the only movement that is kept away. And this contradiction, I was wondering, and, and to me, it seems that underpinning this contradiction, which is a very serious contradiction in the claims, the discourse, and the reality, is, of course, a whole diplomatic uh, maneuvers that go on underlying 
that. I was wondering if you can expand a little bit more on the Geneva talks and why, according to you, the, this movement was kept out, which meets every criteria that the West would want to see from social movements, if you go by the discourse. Perseguition, <laughs> هر دو جی قبول نت کردن گرالا کرده دنیا و هفده تن اند هدن. هگر وان قبول کرده با نونر انشورش هر جوا دنیا و هفده تن اند هدن. و چه قیدهات و آتیا گو او تشتی گو او پی دعوت دکن بنای وان گروپ اندی معارضه و چه والا در دکت. جبر د وان هفده تن اند یه به باندور یه گو تشتی کیوید هندری رجا سوریه د تن بون وقت رفع اندی تن لیه ما در دوری صدی پازده جخاک سوری امره ود بین دنا و هفدیتن آدم تنه بون هگر براستی سرکفتن بخستان آج هفدیتن جنیف ویچه اینو نرین شورش آرو جوای هبانا لی مادام نبرن تی واتای گوان جیش دسپی که دزانی بو بسر ناکه و خواستن دمی پیدر باز کن جنها و پیف جی هگر چار اثری اگر سوری لیگری ناوی چه ببه نو نرین شورش آرو جوای دوی تی دبن گنه تی دبن او هفدیتن و Thank you very much for that uh, comment because uh, at least as a Tamil, it resonates with me a great deal because a lot of those things happened in 2009 before the army moved into Tamil territories. So there is a history there and perhaps a conversation to be had between the Kurdish and Tamil people on the meaning of diplomacy and how it has, what it has meant for us in our lives. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I, I would now like to invite the panelists to join this conversation. Uh, may I first invite Runar Balto Runar is a political advisor to the Executive Com Council of the Sami Parliament of Norway. He belongs to the Norwegian Sami Association, which is historically the main Sami organization in Norway. Uh, and he has been the dominant political group in the Sami Parliament for 21 of the 27 years that the parliament has existed. Balto studied Development Studies at University of Oslo, where he worked towards international student solidarity. He participated as the chair of Sami Cultural Festival, and which, also, which focuses on civilization of Sami culture, language, and identity. Having done that formal introduction, I think the very interesting aspect of, of, of uh, Runar's contribution to this dialogue, it brings a completely new dimension to this conversation that we have been having of the last two days, and that is the, the uh, aspect of indigenous people who have for a very, very long time challenged the state system and the way in which the state system has really oppressed them. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Ronar. The second person I would like to invite to share, to participate in this is Sana Elam Suri. Uh, Sana is a uh, representative of the World Amesia Congress. She's an activist, journalist, television presenter, and well known as the first Amazia television presenter in Libya. And she is advocate for women's rights, both in Libya and internationally. And during the Libyan uprising in 2011, she presented Libya the people in 2015. Uh, Sana partook in the fifth New World Summit in Rojava as a member of the international delegation. So Sana, we are very pleased to have you on this panel. And 
Finally, I would like to invite Hane Sophie Grieve. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but she's a Norwegian judge, and she's vice president of the High Court for Western Norway and has previously served both on the European Court of Human Rights as well as the UN Commission of Experts uh, established pursuant to the Security Council Resolution 780 of 1992, where she examined and analyzed information regarding breaches of the Geneva Convention and other international humanitarian law violations that occurred in the former Yugoslavia. So welcome, Judge Grieve. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, Welcome all of you to this panel. Now, you've given me permission to call you Sophie, so here I go. It makes my job a little easier. <laughs> um, how, how, you know, you were here, I think, thoughts of yesterday's events. And you have heard Alda talk about this alternative model, but he has also critiqued the Gene exclusion from the Geneva peace talks and so on. And you, as a judge, and you, know, you are in the heart of the state system. If we take legislature, executive, and judiciary as three arms of the state, you are very much at the center of it. I would like to hear from you how you respond to this notions of reimagining, you know, uh, embassies, ambassadorial roles, reinvisaging diplomacy, stateless diplomacy, and so on. What, how do you respond to that? And what do you have to say to people who are trying to bring this very radical ideas into operation. First of all, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate this creativity, this amazing environment. Uh, and from there, I would like to speak a few words, bringing it down to the realities and the possibilities. The sovereign state, and all sovereign states are equal. Diplomatic recognition is an important factor in determining whether a nation is an independent state. And there are, as you have said already, Syrian embassies. There is the state of Syria. Regardless of fragmentation in the middle of the ongoing war, in the Syrian civil war. Identifying an embassy of Rojava opens for a competition that according to diplomatic codes of conduct, all host countries of Syrian embassies will be obliged to take side in. However, the purpose of an embassy is to have a representation to have an open door to making one's views known, to negotiate and have a say as political decisions are made. What can an embassy of Rojava potentially achieve? Recognition of the democratic self-administration of Rojava, Rojava's ideal of a non-state democracy, championing women's rights and cultural diversity, Rojava's own model of democratic confederalism, also known as stateless democracy. These ideals may be achieved within the framework, as already said, of the existing entity, the state of Syria. Furthermore, having an embassy might grant diplomatic privileges and immunities that is full recognition under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 18th April 1961. 
And furthermore, the opportunity to have full representation in the diplomatic sphere to further the interests of the democratic self-administration of Rojava. However, the package just mentioned may or not be, may not be achievable. I shall close no doors. In my opinion, it is nevertheless not advisable to fight for this package given the present challenges and needs. My advice is rather to focus and concentrate. Start with what is here and know. The New World Embassy Rojava, a temporary embassy in the Oslo City Hall that represents through cultural means the ideals of stateless democracy developed by the communities of the autonomous region of Rojava, northern Syria. This is creative new thinking from which there is every reason to take heart. Further that thinking, continue to think creatively. What you have achieved with, with this new world embassy is visibility and a voice that is heard. This should not be temporary. You need to be lasting, and your cause deserves it. It is not new that a specific group of people have interests that are not adequately represented by the state as such. But you may spearhead new inroads to translate the requirements of your group and other groups in similar situations into permanent visibility and a permanent voice. In my opinion, that is both possible and desirable. You know who you are and what you represent. That requires no further consideration at this time. Focus on how to achieve permanent visibility and a permanent voice in the decision-making states and fora. A permanent representation will give you both permanent visibility and a permanent voice. I suggest that you opt for both these words. Leave out the word embassy. To use it, you will have to engage in so many battles that seems futile considering your actual needs. A permanent representation is a designation that you are free to choose for your new entity. Permanent representation is a well-known concept in the diplomatic world. Permanent representation is at the same time not strictly defined in international law, meaning that we have such entities like Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, Somaliland's Representative Office, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office. On the other side, Gaddafi called Libya's embassies for people's bureaus. So you may use different names, but I do not suggest the letter. What kind of a permanent representation will you want? One that provides maximum visibility and a maximum voice for your concerns. Then add a name to your permanent representation that designates your concerns, that is non-offensive and new, so that you are free to introduce a new way of thinking that may open the new doors that you need to be visible and to have a voice. I play around with suggestions such as the Rojava Humanitarian Permanent Representation or the Rojava Permanent Representation for Peace, Justice and Humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much from the imaginative art world to a very practical, pragmatic, what next 
kind of agenda. Thank you very much for bringing us back to reality, which sometimes we do need to, although we do need the imagination, as you very well said early on uh, in, your, in your talk. Thank you very much for that. Um, so visibility and voice, and that should be permanent. And you have told us about permanent representation as a possible model. Uh, may I ask how you envisage, because the Kurdish struggle is one we are talking about here, but there are many others. I mentioned the Tamils, which is closer to you know, home for me, and in which, of course, Oslo was very much involved in the peace negotiations and so on, but we won't get into that. Uh, but, but there are also many others. The Kashmiris come to mind. There are, you know, various other people here. So if we take this concept of permanent representation for different kinds of groups, indigenous people, many, many other, what, how does that push international law as we know it today? Can you see international law expanding to be able to include not only the Rojava representation, but you know, the Tamils, the Kashmiris, the various other people in other parts of the world. I mean, in the other words, is there a possibility? Can we hope for that system to be incorporated into the world order that we are living in now? For one, I think international law is always moving. It's something, life is change, international law is change, and even the law of diplomacy, as you've pointed out earlier, it has developed according to different needs. And I think uh, what the honorable first keynote speaker said is so important. How come that one can exclude from the negotiating table the issues, the humanitarian issues, the burning humanitarian issues, peace, human dignity, justice, they have to be represented. Maybe it's not easy initially to have a humanitarian permanent representation, a Rojava permanent uh, representation present at the negotiating table. But if they cannot be present, there must be someone else that take the issues. Then you have to argue that the International Commission of the Red Cross, or the High Commissioner for Refugees, or the UN, or someone else be particularly commissioned to take this up. Then you will have the possibility to insist perhaps futile initially, but eventually successfully, you will have to insist what is peace negotiations without taking into consideration the needs of the people in the war-torn area. You will have to make yourself visible, step by step, but the cause is good, the cause is human, it's the essential cause, and it's even the core or the United Nations, step by step. Yes, we can. On that note, yes, we can, step by step. One step at a time without really losing sight of the destination that you want to reach. Thank you very much for those words. Now, if I may just move on to Runar. Runar, you've got a Norwegian judge talking about the state system. As we know, the indigenous people, not only in Norway, but around the world, have really challenged the state system because they say, even if they have visibility, even if they have recognition, they are still working under the plenary powers of the state. Now, in the case of Samis, of course, it is slightly different, but if you go to North America, if you go to Canada, you go to Australia, you go to New Zealand, they were actually occupied and displaced and put into these small reservations. So how do you respond 
to this idea of a permanent representation internationally, and the UN has done some work on that, the IPP, EE, and so on. And uh, what would you say about the work of your own Sami parliament in the Norwegian context? How has it worked? How has that diplomacy worked? If you can just comment on that. Thank you. Is it, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, let me first. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, may I first uh, offer on behalf of uh, the Sami Parliament of Norway, uh, whom, whom I represent here, and uh, uh, have asked me to to offer greetings and respects to the to, to the new world embassy and to the to to, to the Rajiva, uh, uh, authorities and uh, and and, and Kurdish people. Um, we are, uh, uh, as all has already been mentioned, we are the uh, indigenous people of, uh, of Northern Europe. Uh, really. we, we, we live in uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and, and Russia. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, as the Kurdish people, we are also uh, placed in different nations, and we need to find uh, different solutions in, in the different countries, uh, while still trying to do the, sort of, to walk the same path. Uh, and I think that uh, in general we are uh, what we have in common with uh, with the Rojava, Rojava struggle and, and and with indigenous peoples and minorities, national minorities around around the world is that we are all striving for a seat at the table, at some way. So we so we are looking for uh, uh, a way of getting represented uh, in when decisions are made that. Uh, that uh, are, have a direct impact on, on our lives and, and, and how we do things. Uh, uh, in Norway, we, we, we are a small minority. I guess uh, there's an estimate that we are um, 50,000 Samis in Norway. It is, it is uh, way, we are way too small people to, to be able to ever achieve representation in the, in, in, in the government party, in the Norwegian parliament. Uh, so, uh, so, so the way we, 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 we have chosen to, to sort of create new, a new democratic um, um, system, we could say, or, or, or we're trying to make a democracy within the democracy. So we have the Sami parliament, which, uh, which uh, is the representative body of the Samis, and then uh, consults and negotiates uh, with the, with the uh, Norwegian government uh, in terms of um, yeah, in, in, in terms of all uh, issues that, uh, that affect the Sami. And also, the Sami parliament has a, a representative in New, in New York working in the UN uh, system. So, we, so, so we, we, we have a diplomatic effort both uh, at the local level, at the regional level, national, and also internationally, where we, where, where we are uh, uh, working constantly in, in, in the UN, uh, trying to... to, to to influence the processes that uh, that are uh, directly impacting us at, the, at that level as well. I know, did I answer your question? Uh, yes. I mean, yes, you did answer the question about the relationship between the Sami parliament and the Norwegian parliament. And how, so if, would it be right to say that it is basically a representative kind of role that you represent and speak for a national minority. That is one aspect of uh, of what the parliament does. Yeah, uh, but but also it has uh, it 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 has uh, the responsibility to uh, to maintain and develop uh, Sami culture, Sami language, uh, and uh, and the sort of yes, yeah, so, so it's our way of having self determination over uh, cultural and language uh, rights. But it also has uh, has some um, some. Powers in terms of uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, how uh, we manage the land in one of the counties in uh, in Norway called Finnmark, the northernmost county, uh, where, where where we have a co-management system uh, uh, with uh, the the county administration or the county uh, elected body. So we, the, the whole the whole land mass of Finnmark or most of it is. Uh, is uh, uh, owned by the Finnmark uh, County, no, not Finnmark County, the Finnmark Estate, which has uh, a board consisting of uh, three persons uh, uh, from the Sami Parliament, or uh, 
uh, yeah, that, that the Sami parliament has decided who are, and three from the county, uh, the county which represents the majority. So we have a co-management system that we're trying to, to achieve there. With a lot of conflict and, uh, and a lot of discussions about it, it's, it's not going necessarily easy, but it's, a, but it's a way that we're trying to find new democratic means to, to, uh, to, to achieve and have our, have our uh, voices heard in, in the democratic process. Yeah, well, thank you, Ronar, for that very much. Because I think with most indigenous people's issues, I mean, the cultural rights and the language rights are now kind of, states are more ready to listen to them. But it is the economic rights, as we are seeing with the Dakota pipeline struggle, or in Canada with the water issues and the fracking issues. And uh, so I think that is where the indigenous issues get difficult. But if I look at my own country sometimes, it is because of the indigenous people that we still have minerals under the land, we still have some ecological you know, health in the world and so on because they have preserved it. So thank you very much for that. Maybe we will come if we have time to another round of questions. So I want to now go on to Sana. Sana, you have heard Aldar speak about the diplomatic activities and how they have tried to develop an alternate model of diplomacy that is people-centered and that highlights the problems of the people and their solutions, if you like. And he talked about the solution for Syria as a whole beyond the Kurdish people. Now, when you, you have been to Rojava, and you yourself represent another very small, uh, you know, a, a nation that is divided among several states. Uh, how, what did you take away from Rojava? And what, how does it speak to your own people and their issues? Rojbash, Berivit, hello and hello everyone. Um, I'd like nothing more but to speak about my Rojava experience. But before that, I cannot be in this place without showing my gratitude and thankful to everybody from Rojava, all my sisters and brothers in the cause in Rojava, and obviously everybody, every member of the New World Summit, to give me the opportunity to stand here and represent uh, my people and my cause uh, the Amazigh people of North Africa, and in particular, the Amazigh people of Libya. And if I may, before I speak about what I took with me from Rojava, I would like to reflect only on, uh, on what we said about the diplomacy. Very, very short, because... Very, very short. I absolutely agree with, um, Sophie, what you said, from a, a, obviously a professional and a, a legal point of view. But there's one thing probably someone would say that is only one way to look at it. Because aren't we here not to change the perspectives and the words, but just to correct probably some of the perspectives. What people understand about the states, the normal understanding for any person, is the states are created to serve people and look into their welfares. So is the organizations such as the UN and all other organizations. And the ambassadors, like it's been uh, identified at the beginning of the session, is that an ambassador is a messenger, simply a messenger of people. So why don't we, instead of changing the name, change this, the, the, the perspective and the way to act as an ambassador? instead of, of looking for other alternative names, why don't we actually be a sincere ambassador and uh, uh, carry the messages for, for the people sincerely instead of misleading? That's just an, a point okay, of view. Um, regarding Rojava, when I actually, before I went to Rojava, I heard a lot about Rojava, and I'm sure a lot of people heard about Rojava, but being there is a completely different matter. For an Amazigh person, and as a woman, uh, everything that the, the people in Rojava, every single cause, uh, 
they have is exactly the same that we carry back home in Libya as Amazigh people. For instance, um, the dialogue that, uh, that is being mentioned uh, in Geneva. As Amazigh people, we have fought Gaddafi alongside by every single uh, uh, person, every single Libyan uh, rebel uh, who fought against Gaddafi. And we gave a lot of blood and a lot of our young men who they died fighting for this cause, for the liberation of Libya. Um, we shared every single moment of that victory. But when we came to build a state, we were denied and neglected, not only by the politicians and the, the new government that is being chosen by the UN and not by the Libyan people, um, we also haven't been allowed to take part in the dialogue that was set for the two main political parties that caused the conflict in the first place in Libya. We carry peace, like um, people in Rojava uh, mentioned. We don't see war as a solution. We probably be the last solution. The last thing we do is that we carry um, weapons and fight. We always try to find a peaceful solution, peaceful protesting. Um, we try to connect and communicate with the international communities. We try to speak to the envoys of the UN in Libya many times, but they neglected the fact that we even have a Supreme Council that is legally elected by the people in Libya, elected by every single Amazigh person in all the regions of Libya, and it represents them all legally. We were denied that, and we were uh, ignored totally our demands, our requests, regarding the Constitution as well. When the Constitution uh, was laid to be prepared, they decided to call Libya, Libya the Arabic country, like there is no other except Arabic. And that is what we fought Gaddafi for. We fought for a Libya that includes everyone, women, men, Arabs and Amazigh, and everybody else who has different beliefs. And this is what we believe in as well. When I went to Rojava, I felt home. I felt I belonged there. I felt like this is, what, this is the third solution that we're looking for. In the conflict that we have in Libya, there are only two parties that the UN tackles, the UN goes and speak to all the time. The extremist religious, which obviously developed into this huge conflict fighting um, extremist uh, Muslim brotherhoods and ISIS. And then we have the nationalists, um, fascists, who they believe only in one language, the Arabic tribes, the honor tribes, as if there is one certain of race that has honor and not everybody else. And the problem is, if the UN continues only trying to sit with these, pe these two political parties, I will not call people, because people always are people, uh, but the problems always from the states, the problems always from the, uh, um, these political ideologies that manipulate people, the UN seems to only pay attention to those who they carry weapons to those who they pay money to the militias. Unfortunately, again, we share another uh, problem, and that's the, the enemy, the, the, the authority that causes all these problems, the Turkey state and the Qatari state, that they are supporting financially the militias with money and weapons to cause the conflict in Libya. So many things we share with the Rojavan people. Uh, the connect with the nature, women, and uh, in, in our culture, the Amazigh culture, I don't know, I should have given a, a bit of a brief about the Amazigh people. The Amazigh people are the, the native people of North Africa. That's Algeria, Morocco, Libya, Tunisia, Mauritania, the Canary Islands, and also uh, the part of Spain in Granada and Andalusia. And Siwa in Egypt. 
Um, we were divided after the invasion uh, of, of thousands of years under the name of Islam by the Arabs. Um, even the names of, of the, those countries, are, they have meanings in our language for certain reasons. Um, the Amazigh culture, we had a queen in our times. We were led by a woman, a queen. And we had goddess in our beliefs. A woman goddess called Tanit, and that means fertilizing, that means the goodness, the earth. We, when you prepare the soil before you start planting and having all the goods coming from, from the, the ground. Women in the uh, Tamazight, Tamazight is a feminine name, even the language is a feminine. And, and women are very, very, very important in our culture, in our society. And this is something we share with Rojava. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sana. Thank you very much. I think indeed there are a lot of myths about the so-called the women in Asian, Middle Eastern, and other areas, African regions that we re need to deconstruct. I'm just thinking about like my country's history, which we had the first war of independence, which the British history books call the Indian sepoy mutiny, but we call it the first war of independence, was fought by a confederacy of seven states, and four of them were led by women. So there you go. Uh, there are a lot of myths, four out of seven of them. They were all generals, and they led the first war of independence against the British in 1857. So, uh, so indeed, we have to deconstruct some of that. But I would just like to ask Sophie, would you want to respond to her, uh, Sana's comments on... Uh, I think... Uh, I think your, uh, your question is very well placed, for one. I would love to see ambassadors work for the whole nations. I would love to see them take up every interest of the people. But the difference between having ambassadors change their way of operating and my proposal is that if you want to change the ambassador's way of behaving, you will have to work on third persons to change them. If you start with a Rojava humanitarian permanent representation, or some name that furthers your course, you can start now to work on your course. That's a huge difference. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Miruna. Yeah. I just have a, a brief comment about, uh, also about the, word, the, the use of the word embassy. Uh, we have, uh, uh, yeah, the Sami, the, the, the Sami people uh, is, is also, as, as, as Rajova, we are, we, we are trying to, to look for, uh, we're striving for democratic representation that goes beyond the national state without actually having to, we are not striving, we don't want to create a Sami state. Um, but uh, which is also a, a misconception that sometimes uh, go, goes around. People believe that we want a state, uh, where, 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 where we definitely don't uh, want that. And also that uh, that is the case when we when we talk about sort of the the, the cooperation between the Samis and the different uh, nations. Then it gets a lot of scary in some people's minds that uh, that uh, oh they're they're cooperating too closely. They want to. To, to, to take away the meaning of the borders, does that mean that they want their own state and they, they're just fooling us and then suddenly they want their state? And then is you, and, and, and my point is that uh, I also think we have to be a bit careful in those situations not to use the words that are very much, uh, very much uh, associated with the states, like an embassy. Yeah. There wasn't, a, there, just a small point uh, more, there was a, there was a, a, a proposal uh, that, that, we, that was tested out to, to have a, a, a Sami embassy in Oslo, just as a, just as a sort of a, an, an office that can be representing us in, in the capital. You know, and it was, uh, it was met with a lot of, uh, no, you can't have an embassy, then you want a state, and uh, then we're all lost. Yeah, so, so, so thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. I know many of my... 
many of my Maori friends, and this is in the days of 70s radicalism, if you like, used to establish a Maori embassy, and they used to stamp people's passports, and uh, which of course created a lot of uh, difficulties for people <laughs> who were sympathetic to the Maori solidarity cause. But on that note, uh, can we take a 10 minute break, just very short 10 minutes, have a cup of tea or water, whatever, but during that time, keep your question and answers ready because and come back for a Q&A session.